five, four. Mwah, mwah, mwah. It's your girl, Sunshine. I see the red light saying live. Hey, I don't be trying to cut Ryan off. <laughs> I just don't want to sit there till he's done counting. It's already live. What's up, loyals? What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Sunshine. And Ron is hiding his face every Tuesday unless I force him to show himself, so I won't. But tonight is extra special because I have someone that has helped me tremendously. Aww. And her name is Corinne. But I'm going to let her introduce herself and the name of her business. And then me and her are going to chop it up. And then if you have any questions or anything, definitely chime in because this is supposed to heal you. You are supposed to get delivered from things. You're supposed to heal. And uh, go ahead, Corinne. Go ahead. Introduce yourself to people. All right, everybody. Well, my name is Corinne Matthews Brutkowski. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist. I'm a mental health counselor. I'm an ordained reverend and I do biblical counseling. So um, I guess about my business, what I do is number one, I always say I provide mental health rather than mental health because um, I don't do prescriptions. I don't do diagnosis. People come to me and they you know, present with something that they need to break through from, whether it's addiction, if it's depression, if it's anxiety, if it's abuse, if it's trauma, blah, blah, blah. You know, Everything from what's happening in your heart, mind, and your soul. And so we work it out. And as Nicole can share later, it doesn't take many appointments. People have breakthroughs where, you know, with traditional counseling, that counts, you know, being able to, to vent. But traditional counseling, you could be on a couch once a week for 30 years. With what I do, you could be with me once or twice a month for a total of anywhere from two to six appointments and have absolute breakthrough. Um, I do that as my calling and my service to God, which is to give people a balanced mind, a balanced heart. And if they haven't really walked with God and introduced them, if they have been walking with God, but they've drifted, bring them back. And if they are walking with God, but they wanna grow from milk to meat, then I minister to them. So it's really just a complete mind, body, spirit healing. Um, and then, of course, people always ask me, did you go to school for that? Yes, I did go to school to get ordained, number one. Yes, I did go to school for clinical hypnosis. I like to explain that to people, too, because uh, people hear the word hypnosis and they start thinking about all the stereotypes and they are not aware of the lack of knowledge that they have. So one of the things I always tell people is that hypnosis is actually neuroscience. It is a mental health profession when it's clinically applied. Um, general hypnosis, you can learn in an eight hour course online, but you can only do very general things um, like maybe help somebody just lower their stress or sleep a little better, but you're not going to have somebody have a breakthrough of any kind. Um, that's typically used for what you see on TV, stage hypnosis, simple stuff that's not therapeutic, isn't psychology based and isn't long term. Clinical hypnosis is totally different. You know, you have to have your your bachelor's and your your bachelor's and your master's in some sort of a mental health a mental health field. Then you do 420 hours of training for hypnosis for mental health issues. 120 hours to be supervised before you can practice on your own. And I have been in practice for for 20 years. So, you know, just to put the credentials out there mm -hmm. for those who are like, oh my God, is it mind control or whatever? Nah, nah, it's neuroscience. We are gonna work on programming your brain to do what you need it to do. And that's typically what it is. You know, people will come in and like, I'm stuck. And it's really just like a program. What's that called? A broken record. It doesn't move to the next yeah. lyric. We, we, we get the record going. Yeah. Was that and, a good intro? <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect because um, that's how I thought at first with hypnosis. And I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. But when you did it, it was, it, it, it's not like what you see in the movies and mm. things to that nature. And I'm like, okay, but it's time for our people to heal. And yes. I, I know me personally, what goes on in this house stays in this house growing up. That's how my childhood was. And that wasn't healing me. That was breaking and holding on to things and fearing certain things. And mm. so 2020 hit and you already know all hell broke loose with <laughs> the world. And so, <laughs> yeah. 
And so things that I thought I was healed from, I really wasn't. And so you, oh, you helped a great deal. So I was like, okay, this is somebody that needs to, uh, other people need to, because people that know me know I'm particular. I don't trust people. I always had a trust issue because of my childhood, but yeah. um you, I connected, I vibe with, and that's rare for me to vibe right off the bat. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I love her. And um, my <laughs> sister was like, you're going to love her. I was like, sure do. So I'm like, okay, it's time for uh, people I know to get to know you. You know oh, what I mean? Goodness. So tell them the reason why you went into the field you're in now. Like, like well, that story? How, however deep you want to go yeah <laughs> it's okay it's, it's all however deep you want to go you know it's interesting because normally when i share um you know the exact reason it's one-on-one -on -one with someone and the reason is because um it's so deeply personal and also because um you never know what someone believes and i uh I want people to be encouraged mm -hmm. to love God, get to know God, but don't base it on someone else's experience. I don't even base it on false teaching. You know, open up your Bible, read it, get to know the word of God, and you'll know when God is talking to you. Um, but because you asked me and because I adore you and because I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, I grew up, you know, I'm a mixed person. I grew up in a mixed household in the city of Buffalo and, you know, I love my city, but let's be honest about this city. You know, this city is a very, very, very segregated city. Yes, it um, is. Culture, I mean, literally from one street to the next, you can walk down and you know whether or not you belong there. Um, and that is very difficult for, it's very <laughs> difficult um, to just grow up in a segregated city for anybody. You know, it's areas of your city where you don't, your own city, you don't feel comfortable. But when you're someone where there's no area designated for you, you know, you either got to learn how to be hella confident or you don't go nowhere. Right. And it has a lot to do with the upbringing, too. So, you know, a lot of things that you said, what goes on in our house stays in our house. You know, um, you know, I remember growing up and hearing things like, you know, mental health is not real. You're acting out. Right. Right. You could take a prescription for something in a heartbeat. But God forbid you actually want to talk to a counselor or you embarrass the family if you need to talk to a counselor. Right. And so these are the things we talk about. And unfortunately, that that certainly happens in white homes, but it's not common. They they are the people who are getting the mental health, the emotional health. In minority homes, and I don't mean just black, I'm talking about Hispanic and other races as well. You know, we've been taught not to grow. We've been taught to be suppressed and then turn around and suppress our own. However, we do that. Where there is, you know, emotional control. Don't cry. You got to be hard. You got to be tough. People think you're weak. Okay, let me say this. Jesus wept. Yeah. It's in the Bible. Shortest scripture there is. But the point is, he showed emotion. Before he was to be taken to be crucified, when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried tears of blood. He cried so hard. Now, if our Lord can cry, we should not be teaching our own, don't cry. Don't, exactly. don't understand your feelings. Don't express your feelings in a useful, healthy, and productive way. What do you think happens in counseling? What do you think happens in mental health? You learn to get in touch with your reality, your feelings, to just and to use those in a way that's important. You know, I hate to say this, but in majority homes, they um, not majority homes and white homes, they know this. They know that their feelings can take them places. You know, they know that th for this reason, you see them being it seems um, more driven. But what's driving them? self-belief, self-confidence, self-esteem. What do you see people having when they don't succeed? A lack of all those things. Yep. Well, one of the things you gain when you get into mental health and mental health is you start to build your confidence. You start to build 
your self-esteem. You start to value what your feelings are. You know, one of the things, and I can't remember if I discussed this with you, and I know this wasn't the question you asked, which was my story. I promise I'll get there. But No, um, you, you're fine. Go ahead. I told you, we flowing. So one of the things that I, I teach clients about, and maybe we worked on this, I worked on this, I don't remember, but um, it's called the secret language of feelings and understanding that your feelings are not only valid, but valuable. They actually are a part of God's plan for you as a human to be able to function on earth. So I always tell people, you know, there's two sets of feelings. One of them, we know everything about and the other we're taught to ignore, especially in minority homes. So, um, one set of feelings is your physical feelings, right? If you feel hungry, you know that your body is asking you to put some fuel in it, give it some energy, give it some food. If you're thirsty, you know that your body is asking you for hydration. If you're tired, you know that your body is asking you for rest. If you got pain somewhere, you know your body is asking you to heal something right? We, these are things we feel. We feel pain. We feel hunger. We feel tired, right? Mm -hmm. And you bring it up to your mom and you, oh, mommy, I'm hungry. And what does she say? Either make yourself something to eat or you have to wait until it's time. But my point is she does give you the right answer for how to deal with what you're feeling. Yep. Right? So physical feelings, we get that. Emotions, which are mental feelings, are the same thing they are an expression of your mind that is that is asking you just like your physical feelings ask you for something it needs so let's say you feel angry okay mommy i'm angry what does she say well tell me exactly why. what's going on <laughs> you you know it could be so many things that right Right. And what do we do when we're angry, by the way? Just give me all kinds of answers because there is. Ooh, me? When I'm angry, I, uh -oh. I, I, I walk away, I huff, I puff, or I flip out, or I'm slamming things, or I'm cussing somebody out back in the day. Now I'll tell you about yourself in a nice way. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of me. <laughs> so here's my point. If, you're hung, if you feel hungry and you eat, what happens to that hunger? It keeps going until you eat. Once you eat, it goes away. Exactly. You give that feeling what it's asking you for, it yeah. goes away. So anger, just because I picked that emotion, anger is actually the feeling that tells you that it senses that something is unfair. So what it's asking for is for you to make a situation fair. It's not asking you to retaliate or get even. It wants you to just make something fair, whether that's address the issue, bring it up, propose a solution, um, solve a problem, whatever it takes. But the moment that you actually provide fairness in a moment when you feel angry, it goes away because that's the right response. But who teaches their kid that? Nobody. You know why? Because we don't know. You know why? Because we're taught not to know. We're taught to pretend we don't feel. Don't act out in public. When you get mad, you can't do that. Don't say nothing to her because that's just going to bring us more problems, right? In other words, ignore your anger. Ignore your sadness. Ignore your frustration. Ignore your depression. Ignore your anxiety. You know, ignore your low self-esteem. Yet every one of those feelings, if there's every human being comes standard with those feelings, just like we come standard with our physical feelings. And so... Learning to understand your emotions. Do you know how much of a game changer that is in life when you can enjoy the fact that your feelings are there to help you move along, not hold you back, right? If you ignore hunger long enough, you will die from starvation. That's after, of course, you get hangry, moody, you start getting lethargic, sleepy, tired, can't function, drop dead right? If you ignore your physical feelings, it will kill you. And that people wonder why depression causes people to have suicidal tendencies. Because you are ignoring your mental feelings instead of just giving it what it asks for. More importantly, giving it what it needs. And you know what else? It's asking you for it. Your feelings are asking you. Imagine being hungry, but you feed somebody else. How do you feel? Yeah. That's, you're, 
I was doing in my lifetime, helping others and not worrying and focusing about myself because I always wanted to make sure I was pleasing everybody else, but pleasing Nikki. Yeah, right. That's an example. Um, when we don't eat, but we're hungry, we suffer while someone else benefits. Yep. And then we resent that. Yep. That's another feeling. Well, the point is your feelings are saying, feed me your hunger. When you're angry, it's not saying blow up on him, blow up on her, blow up on them. Your anger is saying, make the situation fair for me. It's asking you to do something about it. It's not asking you to go get even, demand an apology, get a refund <laughs> and all that other stuff. And you know, the thing is, it's not complicated. It's so not complicated, but where do you get these lessons when no one in your family for generations has ever known? And you come from a culture where you don't get to learn because your culture tells you this is a weakness for you to get this information. What's one of the best way to suppress people? Shut them out. Shut them out. No information. The Bible says we perish for a lack of knowledge. That's scripture. We perish for a lack of knowledge. So yeah, you see, you know, white homes and I'm not against them. Thank God, you know, that they care enough about their culture to be like, no, we will not be suppressed. But when can we do that? When can our kind do that? When can Hispanics and when can Middle Easterners and when can, cause you, you know, talk about secret. Have you ever seen a Chinese person in anywhere other than a store or a restaurant? <laughs> and I don't mean that race, like in a racist way. I mean, like you never see them out and about. We almost, do you have any Chinese friends that are really close? No. Neither do I. And I don't know anybody else does other than other Chinese people, right? Yeah. So this is what I mean by secret societies. We, we literally hold we, we, we stay locked up in our homes and in our communities. And by doing that, we end up teaching ourselves generationally very, very, very bad habits, such as how to suppress ourselves, yeah. you know? So mental health and mental health is really important. Um, now, I don't remember how I got there, but <laughs> you, you asked me how I ended up getting into this. And, you know, how I started it was uh, a, a walk with God. But why I, why I dig so deep into it now, now that I'm grown, right? Now that I understand how this applies in the world, how I see it can change a home, which can change a community, um, how it can change a life and it can change generational curses. Yeah, now part of why I do what I do is to help break that, is to, is to get involved and say, listen, I can help. And I don't mean just help you get better. I mean, it, it trickles down. So, okay, the story. Are you ready for the story? I'm ready for the story. <laughs> All right. And then, of course, you know, I've been through, literally through the fire and everything else. But long story short, um, the beginning of my calling specifically to get into clinical hypnosis was a surprise to me. Um, I was the sixth youngest person in the country to be diagnosed with stage four dysphagia when I was 11 years old. Dysphagia is when you have essentially acid reflux that is so bad, it erodes your esophagus. Your esophagus, for those who don't know, is you know the tube that goes down, it's your throat, goes all the way down to your belly. It's how food gets into your stomach and then into your digestive system. But mine was eroded with holes, so I literally couldn't eat. And so I was starving to death by the time they diagnosed me. I was misdiagnosed because actually I'm going to just put it out there. When I first got sick, yeah, my family was like, why are you, you being picky? Go eat your food. And I'm like, I can't eat. It hurts. It hurts. It makes me throw up. So it took a long time before my parents realized just by my sheer weight loss, like this is serious. Like there's something wrong. And then of course the doctors treated me the same way at first, you know, well, why don't you try this diet and that diet as opposed to actually checking me out? Now we were poor. We didn't have good insurance. I'm pretty sure that probably has something to do with why they were reluctant to do the tests that were, that would have, that would have obviously told them what was wrong with me, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, um, I stage four then becomes actually stomach or esophageal cancer. There's no coming back from that, you know? So, uh, here I am 11 years old and I am so sick. I am so frail. I am so weak, um, you know, that 
I mean, I knew I was dying. I knew it. I couldn't eat. It got to the point. <sighs> so I won't get into it. My dad wasn't there. You know, again, something we commonly see in our communities, which is unfortunate. And I don't blame my dad today. That's a whole nother story, which I think I share with you. Mm -hmm. um, I love my I love my father. Let me be clear about that. Um, but at the time, I didn't. And, and at the time, he wasn't there because at the time he was dealing with him. Yeah. So my mother was doing it on her own. And I was one of her four kids. I was the oldest. And she did it on three minimum wage jobs. You know, my mom was working making like four twenty-five an hour at the time. She could barely pay the bills, keep the car going, take care of us, me back and forth to the hospital multiple times a week. I mean, I literally saw my mother age very quickly. Um, but it got to the point where I couldn't eat anything. So she was literally giving me um, like vitamins diluted in water, S slim fast, because back then they didn't have insure. Um, diluted in water just to get something in me that had any kind of nutrition, any kind of supplements at all. Didn't really have much calories, um, but it was something. So um, I got to the point where I was so weak. I remember like, you know, she would sit me on the stairs and I would watch all the other kids play up and down my street. And I didn't have the energy to even yell out or play. And I was so sad. And one day I sat down and I said to my mom, you know, I'm going to die, but I'm scared. And I said, um, can I strangle the cat when I go? <laughs> and she was like, you can't kill the cat. I said, I'm, I'm scared to go alone. And um, I grew up in a church. We, we went to McAlpine Presbyterian Church. And you know, when you're a kid, you, go, you get sent to church. You're not yet seeking God. So you hear the stories, but they're being taught at you, not to you, because you don't know to seek God yet. But thank God for that, because I had some kind of foundation. As a child, I was aware of Jesus. As a child, I was aware of heaven. You know, as a child, I hoped that, you know, it was kind of like Santa Claus. If you're naughty or nice, you get presents. I was just, I had kind of hoped that I was going to go to heaven. I wasn't really sure. I didn't understand salvation and all those other things. Um, but, you know, there's a reason the Bible tells us that all children are innocent and God loves little children and all children go to heaven. That makes sense, you know, understand what that's about now. But back then I didn't. So I wanted to strangle the cat. My mom was like, nah, <laughs> not strangling the cat. And I saw her cry and pray and pray and cry. And I remember getting so weak, I wanted it to be over. Not because I was tired of suffering and staying alive, but because I was tired of my mother suffering. Take your time. Remember, your testimony is someone else's healing. No. Yeah, I'm here, right? So we know how it turned out. Yeah, <laughs> you do. But, uh, but going through it, the pain. Well, and you're a kid. You're powerless. Yeah. And um, I ended up, um, my mom took me to the hospital because it got to the point where I kept passing out and everything. And I remember being in the hospital and the doctors had told my mom, I'll never forget that doctor or his face. Ugh. But uh, he said to her, you know, this is it. And, you know, I looked at my mom and I just said, take me home. And she took me home and she put me in my bed. And my sister's a year younger than me. She had her kind of keeping my brothers busy. And when she laid me down, I was so tired and I said to her, you know, wake me up in a couple of days. That was the last thing I, I said to my mom. So the next thing I knew, I wasn't sleeping anymore. I woke up and I was standing looking out my bedroom window and it was like a beautiful day. And I felt like alive. I felt like I had all this energy and I wasn't sick anymore. And I was thrilled. I'm like, I don't know what happened. That nap was awesome. And I went to turn around and run and go tell my mom, I'm okay, I'm okay. And when I turned around, I was on a stretcher. My mother was shattered, screaming, hollering. My sister was hanging on to my brothers, crying. And I'm looking like, that's me. Mm. And I'm like, oh my God, I died. And uh, I'm like, 
screaming in my mother's face. I'm right here. I'm right here. And she mm -hmm. couldn't hear me. And I'm looking at this body. And I was like, I got to get back in there. I got to tell her I'm okay. And I didn't want to. So I started screaming at my body, move a finger, blink an eye. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk to yourself, yeah. And I remember trying so hard to get back in myself and I, it was done. And uh, I remember being so desperate and I remember saying, Jesus, help me. And then all of a sudden I wasn't there anymore. I literally like stepped into this light and I ended up, I believe in heaven. And it was honestly, I read this later in life as an adult, when I, you know, studied to become a reverend, the description of heaven in the Bible, if you find it is real. And I only know that because it was exactly where I went, but uh, this place was full of light. And it wasn't just that it was bright, Nicole, the light was so bright that if you tried to look dead at the sun and you know you can't that's so bright it was brighter than that but it didn't hurt it actually felt wonderful it felt euphoric it felt alive and it also didn't feel separate from you you know the sun is out there and we feel the light but this was different you were in it you were literally of it okay and the other thing was, the, the other thing that hit you was warmth. There was a warmth. You know how like this Buffalo, you know how when we walk into a grocery market in the, when you come in from the snow and you walk in and the, the heaters blast that you, heat, right? And you just kind of walk slow for a second, because yes. <laughs> let it take over. Yeah. It was like that, it was just, but it was all over and it just continued to feel that way. It didn't wear off. And the other thing was love. There was so much love. The way I describe it is, um, it's not just love. It's every love you've ever known. Meaning, the love you feel, the love you feel for yourself, the love you feel for your mom, your grandmother, your brother, your dog, your best friend, your favorite food. You say I love all these things, but if you think about it, you mean it very differently. There's a unique feeling for each one of those situations. But the thing is. When you're there, you feel all of those loves at one time. It is explosively positive. It is overwhelmingly amazing. And I often tell people, if we were capable at any given moment of feeling every love we know, we couldn't contain it in our, we couldn't, you know how when you feel rage, you know what I mean? You feel like you got to holler, you can't contain it. It's like that, but positive, but bigger. And uh, the other thing was, there are a lot of people there, a lot of souls, but they're not like me and you, where there is skin on their body and there is texture to their hair. It's in essence, like, uh, like I said, you are the light, you of the light and you recognize each other, but not by like you, Nicole, me, Corinne, counselor, friend, whatever. It's literally like we know each other because we are one. There's nothing different about us. There's no blood to speak of that makes us different genetically. Okay. We are literally one to the point where you don't talk with words. If you thought it, I knew it. My response, I didn't have to express it. You understood me. It was so connected. And I remember feeling like, wow. And to be so sick, that was the opposite. And the next thing I remembered was, oh my God, I left my mother down there devastated and uh I said how do I get a message to her my mother I have to tell her this is an amazing place and I want to stay and I'll wait for her mm -hmm. and everybody was saying you know it doesn't work like that what do you mean it doesn't work like that I don't want to go I just want to let her know <laughs> I just want to leave a yeah. note <laughs> and you they're were like happy where you were at you know yeah so um uh, they're like, it doesn't work like that. And I'm like, well, what do I got to do to let my mother know I can't leave her like that? She's alone. She's, you know, lost everything as it is. And uh, they were like, you have to have God's permission. And I literally said, okay, where's God? And the second I asked that question, my life changed. So all this light that we were, that was so bright. Mm -hmm. The moment I asked for God, he came. But it's not a he like a man, not like you think, but there's a there's a, a fatherness to it. 
this singular light rose in the middle of all of our light and it was brighter than us. Yeah. And you know, when I remember it, it just does something to me. But you know how like when your children are very small, you walk in the door and they miss you, how they come running with their arms up. Yes, yes. All of us, the light we were, when that light rose, we bent toward it. I remember feeling so drawn. I needed it. I wanted it. And there was a love there that isn't been, that honestly, I can say I've never felt on earth before or since. There was a, a love there that was so unique that it could only be felt there. It was so deep. It was like literally your purest existence. And I remember him saying, come, mm. just one word. And you don't walk, you don't have feet. I sort of kind of glided like a, like a twinkle to him. And I said, I just want to tell my mom that this is an amazing place. I, I'll wait for her here. And he said, no, no, you're going back. And I was like, no, no, I don't want to. <laughs> Good time's not up, boo. And that's what he said. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you do something. And um, he told me about my calling going into clinical hypnosis, but he didn't use those words. He said that I'm going to send you back to help people here heal their mind, body, and spirit. And I want you to make sure they find their way to me. He said, I'll show you how. And you'll know because when I show you, the light that's surrounding you now will show up then. Mm. And um, he did tell me one important thing. And it's funny because much later in life, when I, you know, in my Bible study, I also found this to be true. You know, he told me, guard your innocence. That matters. You won't be a child much longer. Meaning that I will become aware of my, my choices as an adult, my, my life in the world. And then all of a sudden, I'm not, I'm not totally clear conscience anymore. Now I have some responsibility for myself. I didn't understand that then. Mm -hmm. So with that, he said, look here. And he pointed at this twinkle. And I, when I look, you ever get dizzy or whatever, and you see little sparkles kind of like. Oh, yeah. Every time I was pregnant. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's scary, but, like, but I looked at one and when I looked at it, wham, I woke up in the hospital. And when I woke up in the hospital, I had tubes and all this stuff and my mom was there. And after they got everything all pulled out or whatever, and she got me talking, I told her where I was and she didn't understand that because my mom is a Catholic. Catholics believe in purgatory. Yeah. That, and that you wait there until Jesus comes, but you don't get to see heaven before that. They have a lot of things too, you know. Oh, I know. And my mother really, really had a hard time with that. But the one thing she couldn't deny was that I died. And then they resuscitated me, they say, and I was in a coma for a month. Now, let me tell you, I felt like I was gone for five minutes at the max. And because it, a month? In heaven, yeah, I was there for a month. But in heaven, there's no time. There's no clocks. No one's rushing to work or stealing a moment. It's not like, that's not it. That's not how it works. And, um, and then my healing was a miraculous recovery. I just recovered on my own. It took like six months. My esophagus just totally healed. Um, I have complications as a result of all that, of that all my life. But um, so here it is, it's about a year later, and I had told my mom what God had told me, and I was obsessing to find what it was I was supposed to do with my life. So she started buying me encyclopedias whenever we would find them in a yard sale. And I would literally flip page by page by page looking for, I didn't know what. And one day I came across clinical hypnosis, and I'm sitting in my room Indian style, and I'm reading it, and all of a sudden the light surrounded me. And my sister again, who's a year younger than me, was sitting there. She was like, did you see that light? And I was like, this is it. This is what God wants me to do. And he told me I would be able to do it naturally. Now, of course, I've gotten trained. The world expects that. But I was doing it before I got trained. The book didn't tell you what to do or how to do it. I just turned to my sister. I said, I want you to listen to me, blah, 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 blah. So I had her in hypnosis. Now, at the time, she's like 10 or 11. 
and she's on the floor and I tell her fly you can go anywhere you want start in the driveway go up over the house drift around the city go into outer space and she was having a good time laughing and explaining and then she kind of drifted into outer space one of the things I didn't know about hypnosis back then <laughs> I know now I know very well now is um, especially with children they have an unlimited imagination. If I tell an adult to fly, they might feel like they're floating. Maybe they'll picture getting in a plane, but our real life experiences actually blocks our imagination. With children, you have to watch what you say because they can take that anywhere. Yeah. So she took herself to outer space. So she started hollering, I want to get down, I want to get down. And my mom in another room was like, whatever you're doing, leave your sister alone. And I'm like, wake up, wake up. But she went so deep into her dream because that's what happens with hypnosis. When you stop listening, you convert from being awake all the way through the cycles into sleep. So you just fall asleep if you stop listening. And then you wake up 10 minutes later and you think everything was a dream. So anyway, she converted into this dream and she's reacting like a nightmare. And I'm sitting there going, wake up, wake up. She ain't listening to me. And I don't know what I'm doing. And my mother came running in the room. She's like, I told you to leave your sister alone. Now she's laying on the floor hollering, I want to get down. And my mom's like, get up, wake up. And she won't. My mom's like, what did you do? I was like, I was like um, um, hypnosis. <laughs> I was like, mom, mom, this is what it is. And man, she whooped the snot out of me. <laughs> And my sister eventually woke up and she was talking all about this dream. She had no idea what happened. She had no recollection, which can happen with hypnosis. And my mother was like, when you do that, you are playing with people's minds. You play in people's minds. You could change their whole life. And I said, didn't I tell you that's what God told me to do? And my mom said, you know what? Then you're going to learn the right way. And she started buying me books and things on it when I was 12 years old. So that's how long I've been doing this. Wow. I'm in my forties now. Wow. Um, yeah. And so it's been a long journey, but it started with God and it will end that way. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let me ask you something. I bet you nobody expected that. <laughs> no, um, you had me crying with you. Um, Cause I can't let somebody cry. And then I'm, I'm like, I, I start and then, uh, You're a lover I cry, and a fighter. And movies and everything. But when you were up there, I had an angel visit me, beautiful blue robe. I remember this like it, like it wasn't a dream. I, um, I don't tell a lot of people this, but when you were talking about heaven and being there, I had an encounter a year ago. The angel was wearing this beautiful blue robe. Couldn't see the face, but you knew it was an angel beautiful blue robe and it had gold like um it was blue but it had gold on it and it was like heaven's paying you attention and god is pleased with what you're doing and you're doing what your heart is supposed to have done i fell off track but i'm back on track and i will never forget that that was like when you said about the sensation, the feeling and everything, that's all you did was feel love. That's all you felt. You, it's like, it wasn't consuming. That's not the word for it. It was just hard to describe, but it just a beautiful embracing. It is. When you're in God's presence, you know, because the only you feel, thing you feel is love that's beyond what you can understand. You know, the Bible calls it agape which is basically complete and total love. And that's what God is. I understand why Jesus came and, you know, the second covenant being grace replaced the first covenant, you know, it's because, you know, it takes love to have grace. It does. It takes love to be patient and kind and considerate and forgiving and generous. You know, it doesn't take any of that to lay down a bunch of rules and hope nobody breaks them, you know, and God is not a ruler. You know, he is our father. He is, he is our creator. Who creates anything they don't desire? Mm -hmm. You know, who creates something they don't cherish and they don't want to build upon and protect? You know, 
And so, you know, Jesus is, when he was asked, you know, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment of all the commandments? He said, you know, the greatest of all these is love your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. There are three things in there. Number one, love God first because he loves you. And number two, love yourself because God loves you. And number three, love others like you love yourself because God loves you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Love is supposed to be contagious. It is the answer to every problem. It is the answer to every problem. Okay, I got a flat tire. That's okay. What if God is keeping you from an accident that was supposed to happen 10 minutes from now? Showing you love and you mad at the tire. You better ask, you know, and James, it tells us, you know, to, to, to counter our joy whenever we have tribulation. You do not know how God is getting there before you to keep you, protect you, to help you. Everybody wants to get mad because something, why me? It's always happened, that figures. You know what? You need to learn to look up because if you have the breath in your body to say that God has spared you and yes. you don't even know when, where, or how, you know, we, we have to remember, look up, enjoy that love. That flat tire is love. Yeah. It's I'm love. like, okay, well, I'm not supposed to be there yet. Okay. Whatever you're keeping me from. Thank you. Yeah. The, <laughs> world, <what's laughs> yeah, the world is telling us you know, we got to rush. We got to hurry up. We got to try harder. We got to listen, whatever God has meant for you to do, you don't have to try hard. You just got to show up. You got to believe you have to exercise your faith, exercise it. You know, it's a muscle, it's a weapon. You know what I mean? What good is a sword if you don't know how to sling it? You know what I mean? Like you have to exercise your faith. People act like, okay, I have faith to God. Meaning like, I don't question that God exists. That's not faith in God. Faith is, is usable. <laughs> You know, faith is what is, is literally the gasoline, you know, that causes the engine to go, you know, but if you sit in there like with a little bit of faith in your tank, I understand faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain, but are you even trying to move the mountain is yeah. the point. Are you even trying? So anyway, um, so what's unique about my practice isn't just the hypnosis and the clinical side of it for mental and emotional health. But it is a faith-based practice. I'm a Christian practice, uh, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a practicing Christian, and my, my business is a Christian-owned business. It's a minority, women-owned, Christian-owned business. So people know when they look me up, they're not just looking for hypnosis. They're not just looking for hypnotherapy. They know that they are seeking help from someone who's going to pray for them, pray with them, someone who's going to minister to them as well as do the neuroscience to help their mind and body work properly. Yeah. That makes sense. So, you know, that makes sense because as a person in the church growing up and as what happens at home stays at home, I'm like, um, that's not what Mother Hillary said on the pulpit then you question your parents but mother hilla is the pastor of our family god rest her soul she made it to 102 she lived to she was 102 yeah but what my mother grew up on was an alcoholic grand my my grandmother her mother was an alcoholic so my mother still hasn't healed from that and i told her i was like i Look, I wish you put me in therapy back in the day when I was a teenager with all the stuff you and my father put me through, mm -hmm. but you did it. But now, yeah, I should have had therapy about my childhood issues a long time ago, being stuck in the middle of them fighting and arguing and pulling and tugging, alcoholism going on in the family. My mother never drunk, but my stepfather did. Then the fights and the domestic violence and everything else, you can mess up a kid that way. Right. And because they don't even know what they're learning at that time. Yeah. And what they're learning is this is how love is supposed to work. This is how men and women relate to each other. This is how we communicate. You know what I mean? They learn all the wrong things. And then, of course, in their mind, they don't know that it's wrong. Because what reference do they have as children? It becomes those foundational identity building blocks you know, and so you go into this world, you meet someone different and you wonder why it's so hard to coexist. Why is it so hard to cohabitate? Why is it so hard to have the same values? You know what I mean? Why can't we learn to see each other eye to eye? Well, there's that programming that got put in there before you were even three, four, five, six, seven years old that you know to be true, but you don't know that's what you know. Yep. Yep. So... 
Long story short, I came to you this year. Because <laughs> a lot yeah. of stuff hit the fan. But you know what? It was, like you said, God's timing. You came into my life when I needed you the most. With this pandemic and everything else, you have helped me tremendously. And I was like, okay, the world, I don't know who doesn't know, needs you. I said, okay, Aww. let's go. Because mm -hmm. it, it, it is because we have to heal. So many people walking around angry, mad, hurt, broken. No, it's, I was like, I was broken at one point in my life. And I said, I will never go back there, never. So even on my bad day, I will smile. Yeah, Kirk Kirkland, Kirk Franklin has a, what's the name of it? Smile, uh, yeah, I, put, yeah. I, I posted that on my page just yesterday, I think, or the day before. And I was like, yes, I smile. Even though I'm going through hell, I will smile. I will not stop my shine. I will not let nobody stop my shine. Cause one, I know my worth. I mm. know what he has told me and called me to be. And I refuse to let anybody hinder that. Yeah. Nah. You know, that's, that's true. You know, like babies, there's never been a baby that was born in this world depressed. We come into this world. I mean, yeah, we cry cause it's cold. <laughs> We're hungry. <We're all> <laughs> But the moment you get that under control, you know, babies are all laughter. Babies come into the world. There's never come a baby been born with low self-esteem, right? They wow, they want to hurry up and crawl. You know, they want to get into stuff. They jumping off of dressers on the beds, fearless. You know what I mean? They don't understand failure. You know how you know? Because every adult you can meet today can walk, right? But you learn that on your own when you are not even capable of understanding or communicating, right? Most children learn to walk before they're one years old, but you don't have language yet. You can't read a how-to book, follow a, an instructional video, be told instructions. You literally have to get it in your mind that you can walk. You see all the big people walking around, they can do stuff for themselves. You get it in your head. Babies start out, you lay them on their back. What's the first thing they do? They learn how to flip over in their belly. What's the next yeah. thing they do? They learn to get up on all fours. What's the next yeah. thing they do? They learn to get all the way up and sit on their butt. Then they learn how to balance on those knees and hands. Then they figure out locomotion. Then they learn how to pull itself up on something, but fall down 200 times. Barely ever cry, get right back up at it. Then they get so close to taking that first step. We want to pick them up. And what do they do? Ah, they yeah. want to get put it's back down. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we come into this world confident that we can do the things we want to put our mind, we put our mind to. We come into this world focused, not distracted. We learn failure, low self-esteem and everything else. We come into the world perfect. We literally come into the world perfect. Yeah. And we just it's a breaking process. The moment you actually start to understand what someone is saying to you, the moment you hear the word no, for the first time and you understand it, it's also the first time you learn to say no to yourself. You know, so when, even with my nieces and nephews, I don't say no to them unless there's a real reason that I don't feel like it. And because I said so stuff, it's lazy. It is very bad programming. It teaches your kids they can't. And while it may just be in that moment for that thing, they still learn the concept of I can't. Don't teach that to your kids unless you really mean for them to know that, you know? But again, there's no book. There's no baby born with a manual hanging out his butt cheeks about the personality it's gonna have, the kind of things it's gonna be drawn to naturally, the gifts that is born within this world, you know, and how that's gonna be used. And so we say no to a kid, we don't even know. We might be shutting down their gift early in life. I had a client that blew me away. Um, their family, Buku successful, major movie company they own. And um, this guy, his mother was telling me when he was three, she bought him a video camera. Imagine handing, I mean, today we give kids cell phones or cameras. That's crazy, but whatever. It's not crazy. I just said, don't say no. See, it's hard. But she, at the time, she had given him a, a movie camera. And he was like three years old, still small enough to run around and get under chairs. And she told me about the first movie he made. Now he grew up in a home where they're unlimited. Um, 
creatively, uh, financially, socially, whatever. So it was nothing to her. He broke the camera, big deal. But he crawled around chasing after this cat and trying to film everything that the cat was looking at. And he called it what the cat sees. Wow. How brilliant is that? Well, this dude today, this dude today, I mean, he was making millions before he hit 25, making movies because someone gave him a camera when he was three because he had an interest in it and wasn't worried about it breaking. Imagine if we raised our kids like that. Yeah. If we allow them to keep their brilliance, allow them to keep their interests, allow them to keep exploring, encourage them to do everything but do it safely. So using ways to, in, to instruct them rather than say no, because we don't feel like it, because we don't have the energy, because we've learned to fail, because we've learned to be tired, we've learned to quit. So we turn around and we teach that to our one, two, three, four, five-year-olds. No wonder that the teenagers today can't cope with nothing. Our, right. our parents have quit. They put all this effort into having beautiful children. And after them toddler years, man, they, they're already burnt out. And these kids are not making it to 18 years old and able to handle life. Some kids literally wake up and breathing is a struggle. I know that because of what I do for work. So yeah, we have a lot of healing to do. We have a lot of curses to break. We have a lot of learning. We have a lot of suppression to stop. Yeah. A lot. Now, if someone needs to reach you, how can they get to you? Uh, my website is probably the easiest place, www.echypnosis.com. E is an extraordinary, C is in change. That's the name of the business, Extraordinary Change Hypnosis. Um, you can look me up on Facebook, same thing, Extraordinary Change Hypnosis. And um, obviously my phone number is in both places. Um, shoot me an email. That's pretty much the main ways to contact me. And, um, you know, I hope to be a blessing to anybody who's interested, honestly. And you too. You're such a wonderful person. You've blessed everyone and anyone who ever sees this. There are going to be people who heard this conversation today. And even just this conversation heals something just because they became aware. So thank you for doing this. Oh, you welcome. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> Why? Not a lot of people know what I went through, but you do. You know, and you helped me. It's, I look at things differently now for the hurts that I did carry. The major one that I carried for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you have helped me. And I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that God put you in my timeline to get me where I need to be to do what I need to continue to do. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes. If I needed this, I know a lot more people need it. You know, they don't you have just, the village. You said the same, you said the right words. You said exactly the opposite of what I just said. You said, I needed it. And I said, yes. And that's exactly what I just said. We keep saying, no, we keep up. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. Deep down okay. inside, it don't feel right. You know, it's not that deep down inside, it doesn't feel right. It's all of that lifetime programming that tells you not to that you're fighting against. That's the exact reason you need to say yes. Because if it didn't work for, for the generations before you, it's not gonna work for you neither. Break the mold, yep. break the mold. Forget getting out of it, break it so no one else can get back in it. Exactly, break it, destroy it, so yeah. it don't come back. And that way I'm 100% for my kids and whoever else I come in contact with. Yes, 100%, yes. God you know, promises life abundant you know, more than we can expect, you know, but you got to expect something so he can top that. Great expectation. Yes. Yes. But you, you'd be surprised. Some people just expect nothing to go wrong in a day. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> right. It's not happening. Something's going to go wrong. Something's going to act up. Something's going to push your button. Something's going <laughs> to, oh, yeah. Or, no. Yeah. Or our expectations are twisted. <laughs> Yeah, or we just expect, we expect other people to have expectations for us. You know what I mean? You should have been more thoughtful. You know, why didn't you consider this? You so worried about what somebody else thinks. Think about yourself. Your hourglass flipped when you got born. Your sand is falling and it was, there is a last grain. 
And God is not going to sit there and say, did you fail because of what you expected everybody else to do? No, you have to set expectations for yourself. Don't worry about if you can make it. God has got you there. Yeah. I set it. And then once I reach where I'm at, I want to go higher. I set the next one. I do the um, vision board for every year. Every yes. Year, okay. What I did in 2020 or what I was limited to do, but I speak it to it. I feel like I know what you showed me. I know what you told me. Uh, I'm knocking. He says, uh, if you, I'm knocking. I'm like, okay, daddy, this ain't what you show me. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Right. You know, the Bible says we only have not because we ask not that God understands the desires of our heart. You know what I mean? Yeah. For, you know, those who love the Lord, you know, so first of all, we do, we're doing all this talking and, you know, setting expectations here. There's the real world expectations. I expect to keep going, but what about that promise that God made to do beyond what we expect? So you should set your expectations really high, but your love for God even higher. Yeah. So that when you bust your butt to get to where you can get, he can make it easy for you to go further. And it's not even about having more. It's just that he wanted you to enjoy life. God, he never said it wouldn't be hard, but why does it have to be hard? Because you, you overcome. Think about a tree in the way a tree grows, right? A fruit tree. You mm -hmm. plant a fruit tree. It takes seven years before you can actually eat the first fruits. The reason you want to wait is because you want the fruit to actually grow on the branches when the tree is young so that the branches get stronger. The branches get stronger. The fruit is not going to be sweet. It's not going to be big. You want the branches to get stronger because it can bear more fruit, bigger fruit. So first of all, for God, it's just think about the way that God works. He puts something in you, but it's up to you to actually, you have to grow. You have to be seeking growth, seek the water, seek the sun, reach for the sky, mm -hmm. spread those branches out and don't be worried about the room you take, right? And when you start bearing fruit, get good at holding it up. Don't sit there and crumble under pressure. God is literally building you so that you can have a life that is abundant. The God is unlimited. He is, his resources are endless. Girl, we live, we live, we live on a planet that is spinning at 90,000 miles, the geek in me, the 90,000 miles an hour flinging around a ball in the center of our, 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 our galaxy that is so hot that if we were literally only 100,000 miles or more so close to, we would burn, we'd be like Mars, dehydrated. You know what I mean? Like we, if we were that much further out, we would be frozen, right? And this is just, just, this is just our little galaxy, right? And this is just our little universe. We now know there are multiple galaxies in our universe and we now know there are multiple universes and who made all that, right? We got comets and meteors and asteroids and all this other stuff going on, other planets that never go out of sync. We never run out of schedule the watchmaker right now if god can do all of that how hard is it for him to do something incredible in your life mm -hmm. if you get that if you get it don't just love god because he's your father and a genie you know like oh give me give me give me love him because he loves you and that that is that is life-changing mm -hmm. life-changing girl i just got excited i'm so sorry <laughs> oh no, that's great you know how i am i i I tell people, they be like, how do you talk to God? I was like, some days I'd be like, yo, God, what up? It's your daughter. Or I'd be like, daddy, they getting on my last nerve. I was like, look, you have to have that personal relationship. And then I'd be like, okay, I still got a little Peter in me. Help me. <laughs> Cause I do, you know, it's like, we still human, but it's that, yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I call low on him. I'll be up. He'll wake me up and be like, let's talk. I yeah. wake up. Then I'm you know, it's so, it's so funny. We had this whole conversation and people probably know more about me as a reverend and a biblical counselor than they actually do about hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> when you did my session, Jalen came and moved my phone. You was like, who was, and he was like, I was like, what are you doing? I'm, and he was like, oh, you did say, but I didn't, I was like, give me my phone to go. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So real quick, can I, do we have a little more time or no? Yeah, go ahead, break it down. I just want to say, you know, some basic things because we didn't even get into it. Hypnosis is in mind control. I want to dispel that. Mm -hmm. Super simple. Um, everybody goes in and out of hypnosis on average 15 times a day. 
hypnosis is not something somebody does to you. It's a state of mind, just like sleeping, just like being awake. As I said before, it's the state that's in the middle of those two when you transition. So the reason we do that is because in a day, the average person is awake 18 hours or so. And when I say awake, I mean, your brain is doing a lot, right? Taking in everything you see, smell, taste, touch, feel, sense, think about multitask, organize, decision, make uh, a to-do list, work, responsibilities, your financials, your social life, your motor skills, you, you know what I mean? Your breathing, your heart rate, your digestion, you name it. Your brain is running all of that. Now, imagine if your brain was doing 100% of that 100% of the time you were awake, how quickly would you burn out? And you wouldn't even make it to lunch. So we have these moments where we, we call it this. I was in a daze for a minute. I spaced out. I lost track of time, right? You walk into a room, you forgot what you came to get, but you really knew what you was going to get. You drive home and you get in the driveway and you realize you tuned out the whole drive, but you made a home stay. Yeah. You looking for your keys or your phone and you can't find them anywhere. It's right here in your hand. You know, you having a conversation with someone and you realize you don't even know what the hell they just said. Like, <laughs> just yeah. skipped your mind. Or you're in a conversation, all of a sudden you start having a brain fart and you can't quite collect where you were thinking. My point is we, we have names for all that, that we accept no problem. But guess what? Every one of those is hypnosis. Every single one of those is when your mind said, you know what? I've been using all this energy. I need to cool off a little bit. I need to calm down. And it starts to shut down your conscious mind. Subconsciously, you're on autopilot. That's why you could drive the car. That's why you can continue to listen to the conversation, even though you're not actually comprehending what you're hearing for a moment. Because your brain is like, I need to conserve some power because I need to be awake six more hours today. I need to conserve some power so I can be awake a few more hours today. So with that said, hypnosis is natural. It's in between conscious awareness and falling fully asleep. So when you do hypnosis with someone, you actually just coax them into that station, that state of mind. And in that state of mind, your mind can learn at rapid speed. That's the one thing people don't know about it. That it's like a computer in the same sense where, you know, you walk away from the screen for a minute, it goes to sleep. You tap the keys, you move the mouse, it comes back awake. So it was awake, but it was just processing at a lower speed. It can do only a few things, but it does those few things very well. So when you're in hypnosis, you can actually program the brain. You target a behavior. Let's say, I don't know, you're a thumb sucker. You're not a thumb sucker. We know this, but I'm just saying, I'm picking a Sue back in the day, girl, until I got braces, I sure was. I'm about to say, you got good teeth, so that's amazing. But let's say you want to get rid of the habit of thumb sucking, right? And so in hypnosis, we go finding where that habit began. Maybe you started sucking your thumb when you were one years old because you needed comfort. You didn't get all the hugs, whatever you need. Yeah. You didn't know that when you were one. But now that you're an adult and can look back at those memories, because in hypnosis, you can pick any moment and pull it right to the present. You know, it's like, oh, wow, yeah, okay. I was comforting myself. Well, now grow up with that and you become more confident, have better self-esteem. Now you are the provider, the mother, you are the comforter. And all of a sudden you don't need that thumb anymore. And all of a sudden, bam, you come out of hypnosis. And the next thing you know, if you stick your thumb in your mouth, it feels weird. It's like, yeah, I know I'm used to this, but why isn't it working? <laughs> yeah. Right. And did I change your life? Did I change your personality? Did I control you? Did I make you do anything? No. With hypnosis, you can't make anybody do something they won't do. Your brain is still your brain. It's still on guard. You know, if you put your hand near a hot flame, without you thinking about it, your brain is going to tell your arm, snatch back. Same thing happens in hypnosis. If someone says something to you in hypnosis that you don't agree with, you really don't agree with, your brain is going to wake you right up and say something's wrong. So hypnotherapy isn't about parlor tricks. It's not about stage stuff. That stuff is temporary. The person gets off the stage, they don't remember what happened, but they don't do those behaviors they did on the stage anymore ever. Hypnotherapy is about permanent change. It's about literally rewiring the brain. So when someone comes in for hypnotherapy, we are working literally on changing the way your brain behaves in a particular area, targeting only the behavior you said you wanted to get rid of. I'm addicted to gambling. I'm a compulsive liar. Um, I, you know, am an alcoholic and I don't want to, I don't want to crave alcohol anymore. Um, I can't, I, I'm constantly in toxic relationships. I can't be alone. I want to be able to, to let go. Whatever it all might be, those are specific things in the brain and hypnosis, you can target them. 
that's why it's different from counseling. Counseling, you're talking about everything that comes to mind. In hypnosis, we zero like a laser. I always tell people it's like brain surgery without an incision. Yes, you need training. Don't mess around. You can definitely cause people to have, you know, insecurities they didn't have before just because you didn't know what you were doing or you didn't know how important it is to mind what you say in the way that you say it when you do hypnosis. It's just like, you know, your friend make a comment in passing and all of a sudden you're insecure about the way you look in red. You know what I mean? Something like that. We say things without realizing those are seeds. In hypnosis, you aren't just trained how to actually reprogram the brain when it comes to clinical practitioners, pr uh, practice, but it's also the importance of understanding the language of the brain that someone has. Some people are direct, straight shooters. Other people are inferential. You know, they kind of dance around. You have to know things like that about people before you go talking to their brain. So it's very, very, very technical. There is a lot of neuroscience behind it. It is very, very targeted. The only person who's in control is you. Because again, in hypnotherapy, you're aware of everything I'm saying, unlike stage hypnosis. Your mind knows whether I'm staying on target or not, and it will wake you up if it seems like I'm not. The results are fantastic because as you know, it takes one or two sessions and all of a sudden like, blam, like the way you used to see something or feel about something or the way you used to do something, it doesn't <laughs> feel like it fits you anymore. And, and no more manipulation, no more using things against you that, yes. Yes, you end up having freedom from whatever the specific issue is. So people say, you know, what can you use hypnosis for? Anything that involves your thoughts or feelings, anything anything because if it's in your head then there's a solution now there's now I, I want i want to clarify that you know with depression for example there's all kinds there's situational something happened you broke up with somebody you lost a job you you know um i don't know just have seasonal affective disorder hypnosis works for that chemical depression the chemistry in your brain is off you've been on a lot of medication you've used a lot of narcotics over the years your, your hormones are not correct. Hypnosis is not gonna work for that because it's not in your head. It is literally physically in your chemistry. Right. So, you know, you, you always wanna call first. Don't just book an appointment, call. You know, my you remember, right? The intake on my phone, I sit on the phone with you casually for how long before I actually offer you an appointment yeah. because I'm actually finding out, okay, what's your story and is hypnotherapy right for you? This is how we would use it. I mean, you you end up booking an appointment with me specifically. You know exactly what we're going to do. You are very motivated to do this. And if it's not right for you, I won't just tell you that's not right for you. I'll tell you what to do, what is right for you, where you should be looking. Save you the time of having to call a thousand people in a different, in 18 different fields and get to the source. Because I still want to help you, even if you're not the right client for me. That's how we're supposed to do. And that's why I said you're awesome. Thank you. What do you want to leave the viewers with? Don't be misinformed about what clinical hypnosis is. Uh, do not waste your time living a life without God. Um, and there are people out there like me who are experts. Look for us. We will help you. And you do it through Zoom since right now with the pandemic. Let them know. Let them know. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. I mean, well, honestly, I was doing virtual appointments all across the U.S. and in certain countries around the world already before COVID hit. It was weird getting local clients used to doing a virtual appointment. But yes, you're right. Uh, everything right now is virtual. So you can be anywhere in the world and book an appointment with me. Um, you, the only thing you need is this, you know, something to be able to see me with. As long as I can see you and you can hear me, I can do hypnosis wherever you are wherever you are. Headphones in a quiet place where you can sit back and relax and not be disturbed. Um, the only other thing I ask is that you are open. You know what I mean? I don't need to know everything about you, but whatever it is you do want to work on, I need to know everything about that. Don't hold anything back because I work with the information I have. And if, you, if, you're, not, if you're not really ready to make that change, I hate to say it this way, but don't call because you know we're going there. She you know, gets my, to the nitty gritty, y'all. She gets yeah. down to the nitty gritty. When yeah. I say ask and the question is, I was like, ooh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like, all right. Well, I was like, time to get healing. Let's go. So I was just like, 
boom, 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 boom. And she worked on every boom, 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 boom that I'm out. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, now when things get thrown or try to manipulate, I'm like, yeah, no, that don't work anymore. Yeah, no, you can't use my past against me. Yeah, no. Yeah, right. I'm at yeah, peace um, really with everything. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll actually, and there is something else too. I am launching a course in January. I've already started it. I just have to wrap it up. Um, but it is, you know, because it is, you know, dealing with one-on-one -on -one is very time consuming. As you know, you might be booked for an hour and my lunch might be after your hour. But if we're on the phone, I'm skipping my lunch. You know how I get down, yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, it, it, COVID really made it, what presented a challenge I never had before. You know, there were people calling me from everywhere, especially referral based, you know, from, you know, the network of the thousands of people I've worked with in my whole career. COVID changed people in a lot of ways. It helped people realize fears they had. It helped people realize that their their relationships aren't working because they've been able to get away, get away with not being involved in their relationship because we've been so busy on ourselves but co-living that we didn't realize that I don't even know her or him. I don't like him, you know what I mean? And so we see families breaking down or, right, people just discovering like, okay, you've now lost your job, you've got a degree in this, but by the time you get back to work in this, you know, you kind of have to start all over. People realizing that they have a calling, they have a dream, but they have no self-esteem, they have no education, they have no connections, they have no resource. So they have every reason to shut down and go into depression and be confused over, you know, the loss of their finances or whatever. So the point was, I got all these, man, all these calls I've never had before. And it was like overwhelming that people were like, I need to get through this. And, um, so I decided to create a course all about that, that people, it's like what I watch you through, but it's much more general that anyone could use it. Same types of questions, same type of revelation, same type of perspective, uh, a lot more assignments. Um, there will be a live coaching call, you know, once a week for the groups where we get on there, we do Q&A, Ask Me Live, because um, whatever you're working on, everyone will have their version of that. The point is to take away something. Um, and I'm really happy to be doing this. God led me to do it. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. I said, Lord, if you're going to have this many people calling me, you have to show me how to serve this many people. And, and like that, the door is just, again, those expectations and then God exceeding. Um, so um, yeah, it's, you know, the course is coming. It's called the gift of letting go. And um, I'll be putting that out in January. And I, I really hope that everyone who hears this looks me up because if there's something that you've been stuck on, something you need to let go, something you've you, you, you get away from, but you always get pulled back. Yeah. This course is for you. And it's not a temporary let go. It's an absolute release. Like it is literally it's been. Enough is, it shook. I'm, I'm a testimony. It is because when that was snapped, I was like, yo, let's go. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yes. Like, I was like, yes. Cause it was so much weight heavy, heavy weight that was, it's like I was suffocating. And having you help me get through that, it was like, poof, like it's lifted. It's no, I'm, here's my truth. No, I'm not letting you know, you ain't getting away with it no more. No, 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 no. Like people that know me know I have a mouth if you push me, <laughs> then, but they don't know the other side behind closed doors where my childhood was always affected and saying, nope, you got to be the best mom you can be. Nope, you, whatever you're doing, you got to this or this. But no, I have desires too. Business. I'm an entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah. I No, I'm not going to let anyone use my past to hold me back any further. And once that dead weight went and then baggage was cleared out, emptied out, cleared out, like it was like hoarded of emotions and everything, just I was like, yes, let's go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was like, yes. And that is a feeling, you know, I, you, you want to holler that, you know, you yes. find yourself, it's like playing spades when you slap a card. Wow. Boom. Or dominoes. <laughs> Boom. Yeah, I'm running that. <laughs> like, ah. And I'm bad because don't, I will be like, thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. But and yeah. I, and I'm so proud of you. You know what I mean? Like the more I get to know you and your, your walk now from when I met, and you were already a woman of God, but now I see you exercising that in such a, a, a very effective way. And it's really, you know, that's the other thing that happens, not just for me, but pretty much anyone who's in mental health that really invests themselves into it. You know my story. I don't got kids. I'm allergic. But um, <laughs> I, my 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 work is my baby my life is for God you know and so that's my my reasoning but but uh you know counselors often who do this you know we lay down our lives to make sure that everyone we touch really is living their life you don't know that's how it feels you don't know that that's the sacrifice we're making and a lot of times we don't get feedback from our clients they have a breakthrough all we know is they call and they're like I'm doing good I don't I don't need to schedule another appointment but they don't take the time to do that final appointment to let us receive you know, what is, what's happened? What are you doing? I told you, you got referred to me by somebody that did that. You yeah. know, she came in with a situation. She had a breakthrough, I guess. I didn't know. I did a couple of sessions with her. She texted me. and was like, I'm good. I'm all done. Thank you. Bye. And I'm like, where's my ability to close my notes? You know, where's yeah. my ability to see your outcome? You know, it's like baking the cake, but not being invited to the party to have a piece kind of, and a lot of counselors end up in counseling because believe it or not, we end up investing so much in our clients that we end up drained just by the lack of report later. And so you ended up getting referred by this particular client, like a year or two after I saw her. And when you told me who referred you, I'm like, really, how she turned out? You're like, oh, she did this and this and this. And I'm like, that's what we worked on. Oh, she did all those things. And if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been able to have that fulfillment. Um, so, you know, if you do have a counselor, you know, we'll show a little love. Let your counselor know, I appreciate you. Um, this is where I'm gaining success in my life. And I appreciate your investment in me. You know, we are human beings too. And, and, and we all, if you're a good counselor, you're a good counselor because you got experience, not just textbook, Amen. you know. Right. So, you know, we value connection too. No, we can't get close to you. And, you know, there are reasons for that, but we still want to know that we did make a difference in your life. We still, you know, and if you can't call them up and say, thank you, or send a card, go online and write a review, you know, show the world that this person can help, you know, give some praise, you know, just do a little bit to support the counselor that's supporting you and probably a hundred other people at any given moment. Yeah. I, I, I would say that, you know, that's probably the one thing that um, as a counselor is a little bit hard for me. You know, I know I go to bed with praying for my clients. I wake up praying for the ones that's on the schedule for that day. I don't give up until I know they've had their breakthrough. And it's rare that you ever actually get a thank you. Just, just, anything like that it was a long way but that wasn't good enough for me with you i i needed to do this Aww. because no seriously if i needed it i know a whole lot of other people need it yeah I did. because like you said i mixed my mother's italian she doesn't even know her father's side because She's from an African American slash. Yeah, I don't know how that's. So pure Italians, you're not welcomed in the family if you are mixed blood. So she has animosity on that. I don't know my history on my grandfather's side of my mother. That's the issue for me because my kids is like, mom. Well, let's do a family tree. How can I do a family tree when the one that died took it with her in her grave? And being young, mm -hmm. with my grandmother dying at 15, you don't know to ask these things back then. Nope. Now, I'm on Ancestors.com trying to get information. And I'm like, we shouldn't have to do that. But what happens in this house stays in this house. Well, hell no. I'm breaking the cycle. I said, hell no. So I'm going to do the swab. Tell me. And then Ancestor.com said, if somebody in that family is looking as well, you'll be a match and then you can get linked. That's the problem. They don't talk. While they're alive and their functions are fully compatible, get the information. Get it. Your family's going to need it. You need to keep the generation 
timeline. You don't want your kids having kids with somebody who you find out later is related to you. And you know what I mean? You know, part of that is we've become, um, this is like a whole nother level, you know, a little bit too liberal with love. You know, we, we, we associate love with like, you know, we, I'm, you cute. Let me lay down with you. Yeah. And we, <laughs> right. But, but my point is we do have, you know, you know, back in the day before ancestry.com families were together because I mean, you didn't, it, it wasn't willy nilly hookups. It wasn't, I mean, you courted, you dated, you got to know the family, you cohabitated with not just each other, but oftentimes back then with the family, you, as you said, it was a village raising your children. Family was a thing. Today, our family is me, myself, and I. Yep. Even in your own house. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, it's, I can see how it's so easy to lose your lineage because it's not about that anymore. Yeah. It's not about being connected. It's not about tradition. It's not about generation. You know, people use the word family and you don't know if they really are related anymore, like at all. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, we've blurred it. Everything is such a blur that, you know, I'm, I'm sure ancestry is going to be making millions for, for generations to come because it's only getting worse. You know, we see girls having babies earlier than ever, you know, becoming baby mamas. I hate to say it. And it's in all races. Yeah. I mean, with two or three men, you know, by the time they're smacking 30 and it's, 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 how do you trace that? You know, there are, are more, there are more people in impoverished communities that are so blended than there are in other communities that are still stable. Yeah. <laughs> One more reason we need to instill the right values and stop suppressing ourselves. <clears throat> the value of having a family what family really means it ain't a creed it ain't a code it's a thing yes you know it's a thing you know it's Amen. it's it's your it's something you're supposed to protect and value and not betray you know you don't want to grow up leave home and then not come back and yeah. when you do you come back to show off rather than to pour in you know we we got to stop that we got to stop hating where we come from and who we are and we we gotta we gotta stop expecting that our children will do better than us, but we don't teach them any better. We gotta stop. <coughs> well, Corinne, I thank you so much for taking your time out because I know you be sleep right about now. So I thank <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. We definitely will be breaking bread real soon, but I thank you. I thank you too. I thank you too. Well, this is your girl, Sunshine, saying thank you for tuning in. Like and share, like and share, and subscribe to our YouTube page. This will be on YouTube, so you can like and share and see it again. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you soon, Corinne. All right, bye-bye. Sunshine out.